In this lesson, we're going to look at velocity and acceleration. The first aim is to compare and calculate speed and velocity and understand the difference between the two. Then explain how to calculate acceleration. And finally, explain how to read distance time graphs and velocity time graphs. Now, I think you can make a very interesting link between velocity and speed and the concept of time travel. But to understand that, you must understand a few things first. Speed or velocity are a measure of how far an object travels over a specific time. So you can calculate speed or velocity by dividing distance by time. Distance is usually given in meters and time usually given in seconds. So the unit of speed or velocity is meters per second, meters over seconds. To put this into context, let's imagine a cheetah and a human were having a race. But let's assume that the race stops one second in. And let's also assume that these two characters do not have to accelerate, they're already starting off at a constant maximum speed. After one second, this is what you would expect to happen. The cheetah in one second would have travelled about 33 metres and the human about 10 metres. That tells us every second a cheetah is running at maximum speed, it travels 33 metres and same for the human but 10 metres only. In other words, the average speed of a cheetah is 33 meters per second at maximum speed, and for this human it's 10 meters per second on average. But to calculate this human's average speed you'd have to know two things, the distance they travel and the time that journey took. So let's say we time this human racer, and they run the whole 100 meters track, and it takes them 10 seconds. You could therefore plug in these figures, 100 meters traveled, done in 10 seconds, 100 divided by 10 is 10 meters per second. This is an average speed. We say average because the speed is not going to be constant. At first they'll be accelerating and then they'll be traveling at roughly a constant speed, but there'll be slight slowdowns and speed ups as they travel. So overall we take an average of their speed. But this is where things get interesting. Speed is relative. In other words, let's say this plane is moving at 300 meters per second. It's only moving at that speed relative to the ground, which isn't moving. Let me put it another way. Imagine the ground was now moving at the same speed as the plane. You'd see that they're not actually advancing any distance. They're staying in the same position relative to the ground. Now, if you remember that speed is distance over time, if we think about it like this, the distance travelled by the plane is zero, therefore the speed is zero. Because you, if you divide zero by anything else, the answer will be zero. This is what I mean by speed is relative. It's relative to other moving objects. But here's where things get really bizarre. And that's because we're now going to deal with something very counterintuitive. In other words, logically, it doesn't make sense. It makes sense mathematically and has been proven mathematically. But you're going to have to basically put aside your common day-to-day -day experience and how it informs your thought. You see, the speed of light, light being the fastest thing in this universe, it travels 300 million meters per second. Well, it's a constant. What that means is nothing you can do will change the speed of light, assuming it's traveling through a vacuum. The point is, the speed of light is not relative to anything else. Let me give you a very weird example to help you understand. Imagine a train is stationary, not moving, and it switches on its headlights. That light will travel at 300 million meters per second. But what if that train was moving? Let's say it was moving at 30 meters per second. Would that give the light an extra push? In other words, would the light now be traveling at 300 million and 30 meters per second? The answer is no. And that's because we have to accept the speed of light is constant. It's not relative to anything else. It will still be traveling at 300 million meters per second. As I said, if you think about this logically, it won't help you. And this is why I find Einstein completely mind-blowing. He came up with an idea which was just so odd, so against normal human experience, that I just can't see how he just imagined this. And what's even more bizarre is what he imagined is true. Einstein basically used to travel to and from work using a tram and on his journey he used to have a lot of time to think and he became very interested in a clock tower which was on his journey to and from work. Now imagine this tram is still. For us to see the time, light has to shine from a light source like the sun, reflect off the clock and enter our eyes and we'll see it as 12 o'clock. Now this happens at light speed, 300 million meters per second, so for us pretty much instantly in terms of light traveling from the clock to our eyes. 
So let's assume we're not moving. Well, first, let's say a photon of light hits us and it carries the information saying it's 11.59 on the clock. And that photon of light continues to travel on its merry way. A minute later, another photon of light has hit us and now it says 12 p.m. So as light continually bounces off the clock, we're updated with new information and new time. But Einstein thought, what would happen if I could move as fast as a beam of light? So let's assume that 12 o'clock photon has just struck the clock and reflected into our eyes. But now let's also assume our tram is moving at the speed of light. So in other words, it's riding along with the 12 o'clock photon. In other words, the time is always saying 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, because it's the information we are continually traveling with. What this means is effectively we have stopped time. So if you were traveling at the speed of light, time would appear to stand still for you in the tram. However, it would continue as normal to people who aren't traveling at the speed of light. However, what would happen if you could travel faster than the speed of light? Well, then you would overtake that 12 o'clock photon and you'd continue to catch up with the 1159 photon and on and on, 1158 and so on. In other words, if you're traveling faster than the speed of light, you'd be traveling back in time. However, this is not possible because as you approach the speed of light, your mass increases infinitely and that prevents you from crossing the barrier. Light will not let you travel faster than it. And the weirdest thing is, when you're traveling at the speed of light, space starts to change as well. To observers, the train would look squashed into a small space. Whereas to the person on the tram, the space in front of them would look like it's distorting and bending inwards. But to everything inside the tram, it would appear as normal. In other words, time and space are relative to the speed you're traveling at. These distortions in space occur to ensure that light always travels at a constant speed. Don't worry if you're finding this quite bizarre. It is. It's truly odd. But this is Einstein's theory of relativity, or the basics of anyway. Anyway, back to normality. Remember, speed or velocity is calculated by distance over time. But what is the difference between velocity and speed? If they can be calculated in the same way, surely they mean the same thing. Well, they do more or less, but there's a couple of things you need to know. Velocity is a vector quantity, whereas speed is a scalar quantity. And this is something that comes up quite a lot in this exam, knowing examples of vector and scalar quantities. You see, a scalar quantity only changes in size or magnitude. So speed can get greater or it can get smaller. Velocity, however, is vector. And that means it changes in size, magnitude, but also in direction. So this fly has speed right now. It has quite a fast speed, but it would be very difficult to calculate its velocity because its direction is always changing. However, imagine a swinging pendulum going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. It also has a size, the velocity has a value or the speed has a value, but it's moving in specific direction backwards and forwards. If we call the original movement a positive velocity, then when it moves backwards, it would be a negative velocity. A bit like if our runner was to run backwards at exactly the same speed. They would now have a velocity of minus 10 meters per second. This tells us that they're now running at the same speed, but in the opposite direction to which they started. The distance moved by an object in a specific direction is called the displacement. And that is how you compare and calculate speed and velocity. Remember, velocity has direction. Now let's look at the idea of acceleration. Acceleration is a change in speed over time. It is also a vector quantity. It can have a positive or negative value. Positive means accelerating in one direction and negative in the opposite direction. And acceleration is measured in meters per second squared or meters per second per second. But to help you understand this, let's look at a question. If a car is accelerating at five meters per second squared, what does it mean? Well, it means this. Imagine this driver is accelerating. If they're accelerating at five meters per second squared, it means in the first second they're traveling, they're traveling at five meters per second. Then the second second they're traveling, they're traveling at 10 meters per second. Then the third second, they're traveling at 15 meters per second. And finally, the fourth second, they're now traveling at 20 meters per second. 
In other words, for every second they're traveling, their speed is increasing by five meters per second. In other words, the speed increase is five meters per second per second traveled. You can see the difference between all these values is five meters per second. Another way of expressing five meters per second per second is writing five meters per second squared. You can calculate acceleration very easily by dividing the change in velocity by the time that change took. For example, a sprinter tries to overtake the lead runner in the last four seconds of a race. Their velocity changes from 10 meters per second to 12 meters per second. Calculate their acceleration. You can try doing this yourself now. And here's the answer. Well, firstly, you have to find the change in velocity. So there's a change from 10 to 12 meters per second. So 12 take away 10 would give you the difference, the change, which would be two meters per second. But now you've got to divide the two by the time it took for that change to occur. So four seconds, two divided by four. So the acceleration here is 0.5 meters per second squared. And that is how you explain how to calculate acceleration. Finally, let's look at distance time graphs versus velocity time graphs. Be very aware of which one you're dealing with because you'll have to read them in different ways. So my golden tip for this bit is always look at the axes for whether you're dealing with distance or velocity. So this is a distance time graph. You can see that time is on the x-axis and distance on the y-axis. Time is always on the x-axis with these types of graphs. And what this uh, basically does is chart a journey from a starting point. And for this example, I'm going to use a cat walking from and to a starting point. Now, notice that I've labelled every section of this graph. It's always good to divide graphs up into where they break into different sections. A diagonally straight line on a distance time graph represents a constant speed, and the steeper it is, the faster the constant speed. Whereas a shallower line basically says constant speed as well, but a slower constant speed. Now this makes sense, because if you think about it, the time between this journey here and this journey here is around the same. Let's say this took two seconds and this leg took two seconds as well. But you can see there's a difference in the distance gained at both those times. In the first two seconds, they've traveled this distance that much, whereas in the second two seconds, only that much. So because they've covered more distance in the same time here, it's a faster speed. A bendy, slopey downwards line means deceleration. Their speed is getting slower and slower. An upward bendy line is acceleration, getting faster and faster. A horizontal line means stationary. That means not moving, and that makes sense because time is advancing, but the distance from the starting point isn't changing, so they're not moving at all. And finally, another diagonal line says constant speed, but this time the distance is reducing. In other words, they must be returning to their starting point, and by the time they get here, they're back at the starting point. So let's put this into action. Let's say this red dot represents time. So this is going to be 10 seconds of time. Constant speed, slower constant speed, slowing down, speeding up, stopping, and now traveling back to the start. Now you can also use distance time graphs to calculate certain things. For example, wherever there's a diagonally straight line for constant speed, you can actually work out the speed by calculating the gradient, the steepness, the mathematical steepness of this line. To do this, you simply divide the distance on the y-axis, where the slope occurs, divided by the distance on the x-axis, where the slope occurs. So we're measuring from here to here, so this is the y-axis distance, and this is the x-axis distance. y divided by x will give you the gradient. But that makes sense if you think about our speed formula. Remember, speed is distance divided by time. So as the y-axis represents distance and the x-axis represents time, y divided by x is the same as distance divided by time, so that will give you the speed. And if you wanted to work out the speed over this part or this stretch of the journey, you now just work out this distance here divided by this time here. You will start off at the beginning of the change of speed and where it ends. So now let's compare a distance time graph with a velocity time graph. You'll see we have exactly the same shape curve, but you'll notice that the meaning or the interpretation of different parts is quite different. Because here we only had distance in meters, but now we have velocity in meters per second. Therefore, any increase this way is an increase in speed. It's an acceleration. 
It's not just an increase in distance. That's why a diagonally sloping line on a velocity time graph is an acceleration, and if it's less steep, it's just a slower acceleration. A curvy line would be downwards would be an increasing deceleration, so you're getting slower, but you're starting off faster than getting slower and slower and slower. And the opposite for this line, you're starting off slowly but increasing in acceleration as you go up, so you're getting faster and faster and faster and faster. Notice how a straight horizontal line now means a constant speed, whereas here it meant stationary, in other words still. And that's because the velocity isn't changing at this point. Time is continuing, but how fast they're traveling is staying the same. So it's a constant speed. And then finally, a downward line, straight line, is just a deceleration. In other words, you're getting slower and slower at steady rate. Notice how this doesn't mean they're returning to the start of their journey. They're still continuing forward, but just getting slower and slower. If any part of the line is drawn on the horizontal axis, that means it's stationary. So at this point, it has no velocity, so it's not moving. So our cat's journey would be something like this, getting faster and faster, and continuing to get faster and faster at a slower rate, then getting sl increasingly slower, then increasingly faster, now at a constant speed, now slowing down until they stop. Now let's play both so you can compare the two. And hopefully that gives you some idea of the key differences between how to read these graphs. Now we can also use the velocity time graph to calculate something as well, where we get these steep constant slopes. But this time we're calculating acceleration, because remember, acceleration is a change in velocity divided by the time it took. So from this point to this point, we have got a change in velocity from zero to, let's say, 30 meters per second. And that change has occurred over a time. So you can think about it in terms of gradient, just y divided by x, or in terms of the equation, which is change in velocity divided by time. But remember, this formula can be rearranged. So distance divided by time is speed, but distance divided by speed is time, and distance equals speed times time. And you can also work out distance using that graph with this formula. For any section of a velocity time graph where you see a horizontal line, in other words, it's a constant speed, under that section, you can use the area under there to calculate the distance traveled by the object over this time. To calculate distance, you're again considering the y-axis and the x-axis, but because you're trying to work out the area, you have to multiply them together. So you have to do this value, this velocity value here, multiplied by the time it took. And that will give you the area here, but it'll also give you the distance traveled over this time. And that makes sense because I said that distance is velocity or speed times time. So velocity and speed are always interchangeable in these uh, mathematical formulae. So velocity times time will give you distance. So hopefully you can see how these formula actually relate to the calculations on the graph. So hypothetically speaking, assuming this was, let's say, 50 meters per second, that was a change in velocity here from zero all the way up to 50 here. And let's say this time represents two seconds, you do 50 meters per second times two seconds, which will give you a distance of 100 meters. One final consideration is that sometimes velocity time graphs go into the negative. And remember I said that velocity has direction. It can be positive, meaning the object's traveling in one direction and negative in the other direction. So what this graph literally means is this cat is moving at a constant speed in one direction, then moving in the other direction at a constant speed as well. So this is what their journey would look like, constant speed in one direction and then constant speed in the other direction. Remember, speed wouldn't go into the negative because it's not a vector value. Only vector values go into the negative to indicate direction as well as the size of the value, velocity. And that's how you explain how to read distance time and velocity time graphs.